أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر It's curious how an after-dinner conversation could open a trail that led me through five capitals, the civil war, and the private lives of dozens of friends and strangers. It was a last-minute invitation. Somebody more important had probably dropped out. Did the West understand our problems? We are a society in a delicate balance. On the one hand, there's Islam, the teachings of the Holy Quran, a way of life that has remained unchanged since the days of the Prophet, 14 centuries, unchanged. On the other hand, there's oil. He's immensely influential. In his own country, a power behind the throne, a man to reckon with. You're the consumers. Let's call him Side Badra. But how to strike that balance? That's what your press fails to understand. Look at the way we are treated in your newspapers. Take that story of the princess. They said about that very... Look at that. You were talking just now about the princess. Let me tell you about that princess. Do you know who she was? Well, I understand that she was a member Her of... Her grandfather was the king's eldest brother. She was his favorite. He loved her. She traveled all over the world. Her parents gave her everything she wanted. And when she was of the right age, the family 
chose a good husband for her, a royal cousin. <laughs> but the young lady had ideas of her own. She rebelled. She refused to fulfill the marriage contract. She wanted to go to university, to Beirut. The family agreed. The husband, he had no choice. You can imagine the influences in Beirut. Radical Arab politics, women's liberation, Palestinians, Western influences, all pulling and all pulling in different directions. And then she, she met a boy from our country, a student. She completely lost her head. She forgot who she was, a royal princess, the king's niece, a married woman. You see, in our country, execution for adultery happens very rarely. There have to be four independent and honorable male witnesses, or eight independent and honorable female witnesses. They have to witness, excuse me, the, the actual penetration. Now, the only other way that the accused can be condemned is out of her own mouth, by saying three times in front of a court of law, I have committed adultery, three times times. Well, that girl stood before the court. She was asked and she said, I have committed adultery. But immediately the king stopped the proceedings. He loved her. He summoned her to his private rooms. Do you realize that if you admit your guilt for a second and a third time, I can't save you? Your grandfather can't save you. Go back. You only have to say one thing, that you will never see this boy again. Please. Well, she went back to that court and she said, I have committed adultery. I have committed adultery three times. In five seconds, she had condemned herself and the boy. She pulled three ways. That's Western feminism, Arab radicalism, and then the law of Islam. I shared the story with a close friend. To protect his identity, we'll give him a new name and a new setting, as we must with everyone else that was interviewed. Let's call my friend Dr. Marwan Shaheen and make him a lecturer here at the University of London. Yeah, you were there? I wanted his reaction because I found it hard to believe that a girl would deliberately return to that country with her lover and die for her principles. Look, I don't come from her country, but I am an Arab. I understand that girl. And I understand her family. It's the story of 200 million people. The whole Arab predicament. How much of our past must we abandon? How much of your present is worth imitating? I've not told you this before. My own father has never traveled more than 10 kilometers on a donkey. To this day, he still believes the world is flat. And I am here. No, Christopher, to survive as an Arab, one has to become a schizophrenic. One has to learn to live in two worlds at once. It's difficult. For some, it is impossible. Like your princess. What a story. As you say, all the pressures, first the West, then the radicals in Beirut. And finally, when she's forced back into the desert matrix again, she says, no, no, no. She would rather destroy herself and the boy she loves. She could be any Arab girl in any Arab country. You know, if you can tell that story, where are you going to start? <laughs> well, I've got to check a few facts first. There are two people in England who gave interviews to the press.
How much did they pay you out there? 275 a week. What's that, about five times what you get in England? Oh, aye. And the rest. In three months, I'd earned enough to put down the deposit on a new house. This is my mum's place. I'm moving in a month, and then me and Jeanette can get married soon as we like. Do you mind if I record? No, no, I'm not bothered. Did you get any reaction from their embassy when you gave your pictures and the story to the Express? No, I never heard nothing. I won't chance going back, though. But uh, don't get me wrong, even if it weren't for execution, I'd be hard-pressed to go back there again. From the moment I landed, stepped out into that heat, I thought this isn't the place for me. Smelly tip. Rubbish all over the place. Brand new buildings, you know, falling apart. Cats running in and out. Stray dogs, heat. No bloody booze. <laughs> we had one day off a week. I tell you, we used to wish we were back on site. There's nothing to do, you see. Down to that pool. Bit of something to eat. Having a game of cards in that crummy hotel. Back to the pool. Chock boring. I never spoke to one woman all the time I was here. Not one. Well, I never even spoke to a local, come to that. How did you come across the execution? Well, we'd just knocked off work. I knew there was summer took like, because they stopped all the traffic. They made us walk the rest of the way back to the hotel. That were uh, roughly half past twelve. Anyway, I went in the hotel and I spoke to the little Lebanese guy behind the counter. What's going on out there? And he told Excuse me that some guy were up for the there? chop. Execution. Where? He didn't say a note about a princess like. I thought it was just one guy that were going to get it. Mm -hmm. Keys for 401 and 402. Uh, 101, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I went up to my room to get changed. And uh, my window, it, sort of, it looked out onto this car park, like big open area. And people were already starting to gather. They were dumping this big pile of sand. So, I decided to take my camera. I cut a piece out of a, a cigarette packet, like a little window for the lens. And uh, I stuck my Instamatic inside it. How many people were in the square? Mm, I'm not much good at crowds. But by the time I got down there, you see, they were coming out of the mosques. Funny, innit? Straight out of church and off to see a bloke get chucked. <laughs> time I got to the car park, there must have been... Uh, 3,000 or more. Can I see the photographs? Aye. Oh, I thought you'd want to. Here they are. There were all these... Uh, Uniformed police, soldiers, whatever they are. Yeah. Most of them armed. Round the edge. In the middle, these two trucks. I see them better here. Jeeps, like. Two doors on the back. Yeah. There's the princess. There's the bloke. And that's the executioner. There he is. He's not wearing any kind of uniform. No, no, he's just dressed like any old Arab you see in the street. He didn't have a great big massive shining sword, neither. About that long, it was. None too sharp. Five blows, the lad still won't be headed. Oh, his head never did come off. 